If you make it work for the customer, then everything else is going to follow. We're all here for one common goal, and that's to make sure the customer has the very best experience possible. So the way the Angus Barn got started originally was my father ran into a college buddy, and they each had three kids and no jobs because they both had just gotten home from being in the service. So they said, what should we do? Well, Raleigh needs a steakhouse. We should build one. So they just decided at that point they were going to become partners and build a steakhouse together. So my father goes home and tells my mother, guess what we're, I'm going to do? I'm going to build a steakhouse. And she cries for like three days because she's like, you know nothing. That's all you know is coaching and football and well, we're going to be destitute. I can't believe this. He said, no, we, we can do this. So they were looking for land. My grandfather, who was then the Secretary of State of North Carolina, saw a sign on a tree that said 150 acres for sale for like practically nothing an acre. He goes out, he takes the sign down so no one else sees it. And he takes it to my father, he says, I think I found your land. But there was nothing between here and Raleigh downtown. And there was nothing between here and Durham downtown. So this was a long trek for anybody to come to. Every bank that they went to, to see if they could get the loan for the restaurant would not loan them the money. Because they said, a restaurant that far out in the country will never work. So my grandfather had to go to the bank with them and put his house up for collateral and say, I believe in these guys. So they hired an architect. They said, we want a barn. So he drew up a barn. They looked at it, they said, no, 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 get in the car. So they put him in the car and they drove him out to Charles Winston's uncle's farm and had him walk into a, the real barn with the cows and the stalls and the hay and the loft. And he goes, oh, you want a barn? Yes, we want a barn. So then they built it using old heart pine and old timbers and buying things from old farms. And they built it to look like you were walking into a barn that the cows had just left earlier. The theme was kind of rustic elegance, you know, make people feel so comfortable that they're in a barn. But the reason they wanted a barn was because it was going to be serving Angus cattle. And so they named it the Angus Barn. The Angus Barn officially opened on June 28, 1960. The first year was a disaster because they really didn't know anything. And they didn't even have the kitchen planned out the way a kitchen should be planned out. Both wives were working every night. We were here as kids every night, like sleeping up in the office till they went home. Each couple had three kids. All six of us were in the office doing our homework, doing this, doing whatever. They even had to call their friends from Raleigh. Please come and help us. And so their friends were all out here hosting and bussing tables and the dishwashers kept coming to him saying, Mr. Your, there is no way we can do all this amount of dishes with the way you have built a, this three compartment, boom, 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 sink. So one night the dishwashers all walked off the job. And my dad describes it like, have you ever seen lava when it comes out of a mountain? Well, that's what the dishes looked like as they started to come off the dish machine. So that whole night, as my wife and I were washing dishes all night, we realized those dishwashers were right. We needed a decent dishwasher machine. So that was the first big lesson of the Angus Barn is always listen to your employees because they know what you need to do because they're in the thick of it. The restaurant did end up being a success. People did drive a long way from Raleigh and Durham to come to the restaurant and talked about it and loved the steaks and loved the way everything was cooked and loved the service because service was a big focus here. And one of the reasons it had become a success because they always knew how to make things right when things went wrong. By 1964, the restaurant had become a huge success. And then one night, there was so much hay and there was so much wood everywhere and it could have been a cigarette that was lit because sick people were smoking at every table. They do not know how the fire got started, but it actually burned all night long before a trucker coming by the country road saw the fire, had to turn around to where he had seen the last phone on the road to call the fire in. 
So by the time the fire departments got here, it was a complete loss. My father said, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put in outdoor lights so that we can have two construction crews working, one during the day and one at night. We're gonna get this thing built back in one year and I'm going to make sure every one of the employees has an opportunity to either work on the construction crew or I'm gonna get them a job in other restaurants. He did get it built in a year and a month and all employees came back except four that had gotten other jobs. This time, everything in the kitchen was gonna be right. The dish pit especially. <laughs> but he just got back to work. He just immediately said, well, this is what I'm gonna do. And all those banks that originally <laughs> turned them all down for the loan in 1960, four years earlier, every one of them was lined up saying, we'll lend you the money. <laughs> the reopening of the Angus Barn in 1965 was like Phoenix rising from the ashes. People were lined up to come in, and from there, it continued to grow and get better. My dad, Thad Yor Jr., was a huge man. He wore a size 14 shoe and his hands were huge and he was just big built man. They called him the gentle giant. And the greatest compliment about the man that I've ever heard, somebody said, you could be at a party of a thousand people and you could walk in and you wouldn't hear him or you wouldn't see him, but you would immediately know that he was there. He had that kind of presence. He became the iconic restaurateur because he was so respected by how he treated his employees, which was pretty much unheard of. He had the first profit sharing program and insurance for family coverage and individual coverage because he wanted this to become a career place and not just a, I'm gonna work here for the summer place. He made this a place where the employees felt like this was their home. They were so important. I started working and just waiting some tables, to, and then that was it. And I got the restaurant bug, so to speak. So I went through the wine cellar, became the cellar master, and then uh, Van asked me to become the general manager. This is unlike any experience in the world. It has nothing to do with the steak in front of you. It has everything to do with the personalities, the history that's been out here. If everybody knew how much we support each other, how much the structure of the Angus Barn holds so many people up. Um, you know, and that structure being in place gives so many other people an opportunity to reach for the next level. And that's on a professional and a personal level. We care, uh, we hire that way, and we hope that we show it every single day and uh, how we present ourselves. We only get better if all of us consider what we need to do for our customers and our employees. And he preached that all the time, at every level. You know, that it was important that restaurateurs needed to be one with each other. They needed to help each other because it was growing the hospitality industry, not just our particular restaurant. So he became the president of the North Carolina Restaurant Association and then the president of the National Restaurant Association. He went on to receive numerous restaurant awards and he always remained extremely humble, extremely hardworking and extremely kind. Never forgot the little guy, which in his mind was really the big guy. As I was working with him, I said, you know what? I would hate to be driving by the Angus barn one day and say, I really should have thought about taking that over. I really should have thought about asking my dad, because he never was going to push me that way. He, he wanted it to come from me. So I said to him one night, I said, I would really like to start learning from you to see if this is something that I would want to do. So we designed our own training program for me. I went through every single department of the restaurant for like six weeks in every department, starting with janitorial all the way through every department. And then I actually told him, I said, Dad, I want to do this. And I cannot believe what a blessing that was. That must have been a God thing because he went to the doctor one day because he had a slight pain in his stomach and found out that he was already in stage four pancreatic cancer. And 
so he passed away in, in 1988 when he was only 56. And that was uh, uh, the hardest, probably the hardest thing I've ever gone through so far in my life was, was losing him. For me to have told him, Dad, I want to do this. If I had told him after he got sick, I don't know that it would have meant as much because he might have thought that I was saying that because he got sick, but he knew when he got sick that I had the passion. I was already working 100 hours a week in the restaurant business with him at that time. Anyway, I mean, I would be the last one to leave and the first one here because that's what he instilled in me since I was seven. He was like, you will work harder than anyone else works when you work here because you're my child and you can't be getting away with doing anything easy. I had been previously married. I had gotten out of grad school and started in advertising and my, my wife came home and she said, you're not gonna believe what happened. And I said, what? She said, well, I had a bunch of executives come in from Texas and they said, we want to go out. We heard there's this restaurant, the Angus Barn. It's a great steakhouse. And there's only great steakhouses in Texas, so we want to go there. So I took him there. I love going to the Angus Barn. She goes, there's five of us. And we walked in, and we didn't get served for a while. And she said, and then when finally the food did come, some of it was cold. And she said, and I was like mortified. I was thinking, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? And she said, first a manager came out and was apologizing and the, the plates were immediately taken up and hot food was put down and it was delicious and they all brought us a round of drinks and they said they wanted to treat us to desserts and everybody was great. These guys were loving it. And she said, and then this lady, Van, came out, the owner, and she proceeded to talk to us and wine and dine us and make us feel like a million dollars. And she said, every one of these Texas executives walked out thinking this was the greatest place in the world. Not only did they make good for the mistake, they recovered in spades. And I said, wow. So that, I said, that's really cool. I said, I need to meet this lady someday. And she goes, yeah. Well, about three days later, there's a letter in the mailbox. And it says, dear Lisa, I am so sorry for what happened at the restaurant the other night. Please accept my apologies, but most importantly, please give us another chance. And there was a gift certificate attached to that to come back to dinner. My, you know, uh, I, I, I got a divorce and I was continuing to... No, no, I, I still hadn't met her yet. And there was a, uh, an event. We were sponsoring it through the radio station. And lo and behold, Van Yours at the event. And I immediately had to meet her. One of her employees was there. I said, please, I need to meet her. And of course, I looked at her and I immediately was like, oh my God, look at this woman. She's the most beautiful, gorgeous, perfect lady. <laughs> and I said, I told her the story I just told you. And she looked at me and she was around her managers and they were all kind of like, yep, yep, that's what she does. That's what she does. I said, that was amazing. I said, if there is any time we can ever help you. And she said, well, matter of fact, there is. She said, um, my dad just passed away and he and my mom started a foundation for mental illness and they did a walk in his honor for the very first time and we're going to make this an annual event and i said well i want to help and from there we started a friendship and i got to know her mom really really well and the family really well and of course van really well and i finally got brave enough to ask her to go out with me it was, no, let, let me let me let me bite in here this was adorable because when his ex-wife, Lisa, was bringing Christopher over to do the switch, parent to parent, bringing the child over, she said, Steve, why aren't you dating anybody? Was, yeah. And he said, well, I, Lisa, I'm, I'm working and I, I don't have time. I'm just like, and she goes, why don't you ask Van you're out? She goes, you guys would be great together. His yeah. ex-wife says that to him. So he thinks about it for a while and he calls me and I said, no. Because I mean, I knew he was married and had a child and all this. I said, no, sorry. Because I knew Lisa and that felt really wrong. So he called me again, he called me like five times. Finally, I said, I'll meet you at the movies. I'll meet you. And so that was it. When, that was it. The minute I got out of my car, I said, oh my gosh, I think I'm gonna marry that guy. I'd like to think of myself now after 26 years as a restaurateur, 
But I know this, every day when I think I know just about everything, she'll do something and I'll go, damn it, where did she get that? Why didn't I think of that? So Van continues on a daily basis to teach me how to be better and better and better at the restaurant. Well, I, I, I disagree because I'm the one that has the crazy ideas and Steve's the one that reels me back into reality, makes it more realistic. Like, okay, okay, we might be able to do that, but let's plan how. You know, the ultimate Angus Barn experience has to start with, believe it or not, our signature cheese and crackers. We have been making these for over 50 years. They are shipped all over the world. People sought after them day in and day out. And during the holidays, we have to make them 24 hours a day just to keep up with the demand. Our wedge salad is gorgeous. It stands high like this giant teepee. And to have it with our homemade blue cheese dressing and bacon crumbles and all those accoutrements that go on it is wonderful. And our, our spinach salad with our, with our heated poppy seed dressing is just a real favorite in these parts. So you can't miss out on some of our incredible sides. Our stuffed baked potatoes are to die for. Our cream spinach has been honed to perfection. You don't want to miss that Oh, don't stuff. forget the baby back ribs. That is one, we, although we're a steakhouse, we are so known for our ribs because it's like a three-day process to make them. We soak them in a saltwater brine and then when we put them on the grill, we brush them with honey and make our own barbecue sauce. And our, we are really well known for our baby back ribs. To come in this place and to walk down and to have one of our signature ribeyes or our famous tomahawk, which weighs in at almost 50 ounces, and that is seared and roasted to perfection, um, is something that everyone should experience at least once in their lives when they come to their Angus barn. And some of our desserts, like our Gremonier Parfait, our Blackberry Cobbler, that's, and our New York style cheesecake, are just, everything is made in house. End it with our award-winning chocolate chess pie, which is ooey and gooey and chocolatey beyond belief. And with a scoop of vanilla ice cream or our homemade whipped cream, I like to tell people that's God's way of telling you he loves you. We've been honing these recipes day in and day out for years and years and years. There isn't a year that goes by that we don't make sure that the taste profile on these things is perfect. In the restaurant world, we're not serving a meal, we're making a memory. Anybody can cook a steak. It's, it's how you serve the steak. It's how you make that customer feel. The things that never change here, ever, 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 are one, the customer is always the customer. When you think about it, the customers are really the real boss because if they tell you they, that they need something to change, you're gonna think hard about changing it because they're giving you great feedback. Customer's not always right, but the customer's always the customer. And two, we are ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen. You make sure you have those two things going and everything else can fall into place after that. Family is the most important thing to us. Both our kids, we'd say to them on a regular basis, you don't have to do this. You know, we want you to do what you want to do. But hoping, you know, inside that, boy, wouldn't it be nice if there was another generation a family that would continue to shepherd this restaurant. And that is a reality. They are both involved. They are getting more and more involved. And it's so nice to have your whole family here. I notice every detail that makes the Angus Barnes what it is and so special. And it's obviously such a place with such grandeur and it's humongous and overwhelming sometimes. On the walls, there's all these pictures of my grandparents and the people who have been working here for 40 years, they knew my grandparents and I never had the opportunity to meet them, but you can feel them when you're here. And that's something really special.
Being in the kitchen, it's like a whole nother world to me. It's, it's home to me. It's, I love working with my hands. When a guest gets their meal on a plate and enjoys every moment of it, it just fills my heart with joy. It really does. To know that I created an art masterpiece. I used my own hands to create something special that someone will always come back to get more of. Watching my mom, she just breaks the glass ceiling for what women in the hospitality industry have ever done. And she's a legend for that. And my dad, he runs all the things kind of in the backside of things and we need him for that because he's made this restaurant even more than we could have imagined. And so I just, I just really have the most respect for them. Number one, for my mom who has taught me, if you're gonna do it right, you're gonna do it right and not halfway. So you're not having to come back and redo it, you're gonna do it right. And then with my dad, it's full commitment. If you say you're gonna do something, you're gonna do it. I feel unbelievably honored that the Angus Barn is being inducted into the Steakhouse Hall of Fame because uh, to be up there with all those other steakhouses that are in it is putting us on a level that we're so proud to be on. I'm thrilled beyond words to have even been thought of. We're just truly blessed and honored. Especially when you look at the company that we are with. As Van was saying, these are some of the greatest steakhouses in the country. One of the inductees into the Steakhouse Hall of Fame, Tommy Hall, he made the comment, service before self. And I think that is so true. It is all about service. It is all about hospitality to the guest. We are honored to be in the hospitality business. We are honored to be the ones that extend hospitality that guests that need it. Yeah, this is not a have to have. This is a want to have. If you have to have food, you're going to go to the grocery store. This is a want to have because you've saved your money and you want to bring your family out here. So that's why each guest has to be treated like the most important person in the world when they walk through those doors. They don't come here because they're starving to death. They come here because they've made a conscious decision, a choice. And it's up to us to make sure they made the right choice.